In late 1943, the Allied nations were gaining ground on all major fronts in the global war against the aggressors in Europe and Asia. In October, American and British fighting men were moving up the Italian peninsula toward Rome. In Eastern Europe, the Red Army was pushing back the Nazis in the Ukraine and the Crimea. In the South Pacific, American Marines were preparing to assault a major Japanese stronghold in the Northern Solomons, the island of Bougainville. In Washington in mid-1943, the chiefs of Allied fighting forces agreed that the offensive against the enemy in the South Pacific must be accelerated. It was of the utmost importance to Allied leaders that a strategic plan be formulated, which would call for the knocking out of the enemy's key South Pacific bases at the earliest possible moment. With Guadalcanal and the New Georgia Group in U.S. hands, the campaign up the Solomon's Ladder reached its final phase, the assault against Bougainville. At newly won bases in the central and southern Solomons, preparations were made for the operation against that Japanese island stronghold. First step in the campaign was the mounting of an air offensive of sufficient proportions to soften up the island for the invasion, and also to knock out other enemy airfields within fighter range of Bougainville. In the late summer of 1943, U.S. forces prepared to launch the attack against Japanese positions in the strategic northern Solomons in the campaign which would give the U.S. control of the entire Solomon's chain. Every now and then, the men at the forward bases took a few minutes off from military duties. Tireless performers like Joe E. Brown knew well how important it was for the men to relax. Even the big brass forgot about the war once in a while. To the westward in Australia, Southwest Pacific Theater Commander General Douglas MacArthur endorsed the proposed attack on Bougainville. Though not under his direct command, the operation was to be conducted under his supervision. The offensive was carefully timed. While GIs drove up the coast of New Guinea, Marines pushed the attack up the Solomon chain to Bougainville. Weeks before the invasion date, planes equipped with cameras crisscrossed the target area, taking numerous photographs of the island terrain below. Once the vital information was recorded on film, the planes raced back to their base with their high-priority cargo. At the base, other members of the unit were waiting, ready to go to work on the film. The job done by the photo reconnaissance units in the Pacific during World War II was a key factor in the success of U.S. invasions in that theater. On the reconnaissance camera and its efficient use depended the lives of thousands of American fighting men. The successive steps in the operation were carefully coordinated so that no time would be lost. 
Less than an hour after the enemy territory had been photographed, the evidence was being developed at a forward U.S. base. The most recently prepared enemy installations were now relatively easy for U.S. intelligence officers to locate. Every square mile of the area under consideration was examined and re-examined by skilled photo interpreters who spotted camouflaged gun positions which would prove of particular interest to Navy gun crews and bomber pilots. With their targets pinpointed, the pilots wasted no time in adding the finishing touches to the operation. Often it was only a few hours from the time the area had been photographed to the moment when bombs were falling on the newly spotted positions. For several weeks, U.S. bombers gave Bougainville and the adjacent islands a thorough going over, preparatory to the invasion. In early October 1943, troops of the 3rd Marine Division, which was to make the assault, began boarding ship at forward U.S. bases. The vessels which were to carry the invasion units to the landing beaches were combat loaded. That is, equipment was packed into the ships in such a way that the vehicles and supplies which would be needed first could be unloaded immediately. Finally, all the preparations were completed and the campaign against Bougainville was ready to be launched. The ships carrying the assault waves moved out of their berths at the rendezvous area on the morning of October 31st. The most important offensive against the enemy in the Solomons since the attack on Guadalcanal was underway. Every ship in the area that could be spared was pressed into service for the operation. Preceding the main assault at Bougainville, a preliminary landing was made on the Treasury Islands by New Zealand troops in late October. In addition, U.S. Marines made a landing on Choiseul to draw the enemy's attention to that island. Meanwhile, the main assault force moved toward Bougainville. On November 1st, the invasion fleet was in position offshore. American commanders anticipated very heavy enemy resistance. At 6.45 on D-Day morning, Marines of the 3rd Division took to the boats and prepared for their first engagement with the enemy. But a few of the officers and non-coms were veterans of other campaigns with other divisions. The operational plans called for the first wave of assault troops to land at the beaches of Empress Augusta Bay at 7.30 on the morning of November 1st. Four minutes ahead of schedule, the first waves of Marines hit the beach under strong enemy fire. The tension which always preceded an invasion was broken. Once ashore, the Marines went about their business as they'd been taught. The battle for the beachhead was hotly contested. After the initial foothold had been won, the usual precautions had to be taken to ensure the successful defense of that tiny area. Any enemy counterattack would have to contend with a firmly entrenched beachhead force. But the invading troops were concerned not only with defense, the Marines subscribed to the theory that the best defense is a good offense and followed that course in the campaign on Bougainville. 
Until the enemy force at Cape Torokina was overcome, the battle was one of small groups. Marine emphasis on small unit training, especially in rifle squad and platoon tactics, paid off on Bougainville. The enemy had to be dug out of the jungle. The pattern for reducing enemy positions was growing steadily more efficient. The flamethrower enabled U.S. combat teams to achieve their objectives more rapidly and thereby saved many American lives. The seizure of Cape Torokina was the key to success. The winning of the American beachhead on Bougainville was no easy job. The Marines of the 3rd Division who made the assault and the soldiers of the 37th Army Division who joined the battle on the 8th day suffered considerable casualties. But the strategy called for much more than a mere foothold along the beach. The drive inland to establish a perimeter of larger proportions was stepped up and the Marines and soldiers seized every advantage to extend the American-held territory farther into the interior. The close integration of ground forces with tanks functioning together smoothly proved its effectiveness in gaining ground against the enemy. Meanwhile, directly following the invasion at Empress Augusta Bay, a Japanese fleet raced southward from Rabaul toward Bougainville, bent on wiping out the beachhead force. The Japanese fleet included three heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, and six destroyers. Originally, the enemy had planned to bring troop ships down for a counter landing. But after the Japanese fleet had been spotted by Allied aircraft, the fast warships continued alone, intent on annihilating the American amphibious forces. The enemy's plan called for a quick strike to be accomplished before U.S. naval units could get set. Thus, the enemy was counting on surprise. But the U.S. Navy was not caught off guard. A force of four cruisers and eight destroyers headed north from the Central Solomons, and thanks to accurate information on the movements of the enemy fleet, intercepted the Japanese naval units at a point some 45 miles northwest of Empress Augusta Bay. The battle was joined at 2.45 in the morning of November 2nd. Head-on battle raged for five and a half hours. American gunners were finding their targets with considerable success. The enemy force suffered severe losses. The naval battle of Empress Augusta Bay was an overwhelming U.S. victory. Ashore, the Marines and soldiers were engaged in a series of continuing actions. Throughout November, the campaign to extend the American beachhead was a grueling job of driving the enemy off virtually every square foot of the territory in question. The assignment called for all the perseverance the U.S. fighting men could muster. With materiel arriving on Bougainville in greater quantities, the offensive against the stubbornly resisting enemy developed more and more power as the weeks went by. The American ground forces knew well with what determination the enemy would fight. Before each thrust farther inland, artillery was brought into play to soften up the area. The artillerymen often had their targets pinpointed for them by light spotter planes, which proved invaluable in locating new enemy positions for the gunners. Fire! 
On November 10th, Admiral Bull Halsey arrived on Bougainville and checked over the progress of the fighting with Marine General Roy Geiger, who had taken over as ground forces commander the day before. The Admiral, who as commander of the South Pacific area was in charge of the entire operation, seemed well satisfied with the course of the action and the fight for control of the last major enemy island in the Solomons. One group of Marines drove inland along the Piva Trail against mounting resistance. By mid-November, they had penetrated nearly three miles into the interior when they encountered an enemy ambush at Coconut Grove. The Marines attacked all along the line. All that day, the Marines carried the fight to the enemy and slowly took possession of the area. After the engagement at Coconut Grove, there was a general advance along the entire front. But there was trouble ahead and the troops were expecting it. On November 15th, Marines gained more than a thousand yards along the Numa Numa Trail, while at other points along the front, soldiers and Marines gained up to 1,500 yards in the day's advance. On November 19th, the Marines had progressed along the Numa Numa Trail beyond the juncture of two branches of the Piva River. The advancing troops were occupied with small knots of the enemy along the route, and these were taken care of with dispatch. Some 900 Japanese were killed during the first three weeks of the fight for Bougainville. But the men sensed that the big battle was just shaping up. That battle was fought at Piva Forks, beginning on November 19th. On that day, advanced marine patrols ran into heavy enemy fire. The Battle of Piva Forks will live long in the memory of the men who fought there. Men like Marine Captain John Scott of South Bend, Indiana. Our battalion, the 3rd Battalion of the 3rd Marine Regiment, was on the left flank. Our objective was the high ground which the enemy commanded. To our battalion, the taking of that ground was the toughest part of the Bougainville campaign. The enemy had penetrated our position, and we had to shoot it out with him at point-blank range. Often, the enemy was little more than 10 yards away. One of our companies was all but knocked out in the pitched battle. At Peeba Forks, the 796 Marines of our battalion were opposed by some 4,000 enemy troops, giving them man for man about a six to one advantage. But we took the high ground and staved off a quick enemy counterattack. In the late afternoon of November 21st, after a day of very tough going, we had our objective and we hung on to it. We wiped out quite a number of enemy troops, but there were still quite a lot left. Our Japanese language specialists worked hard to get them to surrender. Taking prisoners was worth all the trouble it usually turned out to be. Most Japanese soldiers, of course, preferred not to give themselves up. They couldn't seem to believe that they wouldn't be tortured and shot. From time to time, our intelligence officers picked up some really valuable information, sometimes from the prisoners themselves, sometimes from documents which they carried with them. Strangely, many of the captured Japanese were quite willing to talk. Some volunteered information about their units in great detail. Naturally, these indications of the current positions and plans for immediate movement of their units were of great value to our commanders. In our part of the Battle of Piva Forks, 1,696 Japanese were killed by our battalion alone. We suffered some casualties too, but not many in comparison. Of course, to the men who were hit, it was the toughest battle of all, no matter how light the casualty figures. In the 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marine Regiment, 
107 men were wounded at Peva Forks, and 27 men in our battalion didn't make it. With an extended beachhead secured via the victory in the six-day battle at Piva Forks and in other brief but bitter engagements with the enemy, work was rushed on the airstrips, which would give the U.S. control of the entire Solomons area. While the fighting continued a few miles inland, CBs worked at top speed to finish the precious strips. Once again at Bougainville, the Marston Mat proved its value as an effective foundation for a landing strip in a territory that was often likely to be muddy. Before long, the strip was in perfect operating condition, safe enough to enable the Air Force to bring in a precious cargo, the first batch of Army nurses, who, in a matter of moments, turned Bougainville from a hot, foul-smelling patch of ground into a pleasant, stimulating tropical island. By the end of 1943, the American perimeter, which had been the U.S. objective at Bougainville, was firmly established. From that small area, U.S. forces controlled the island and the entire Northern Solomons group as well. But the U.S. had to pay dearly for the territory inside that perimeter. During the campaign on Bougainville, nearly a thousand Marines and soldiers gave their lives. And another field of crosses on one more Pacific island marked their sacrifice. By December, the men who had been in the lines for weeks began to enjoy some of the little luxuries of life. After a diet of straight K rations, the men had to get accustomed slowly to regular meals. They'd almost forgotten food could taste so good. Less than a month after D-Day, the men on Bougainville had their own bakery, which turned out bread, rolls, and cake for thousands of hungry customers. In 1944, a sizable quantity of fruits and vegetables was raised right on the island to help provide a balanced diet for the men who were still putting in a good day's work guarding the perimeter. The camp truck farmers had the willing cooperation of the island's Melanesian natives who worked at odd jobs. The Japanese soldiers who had been taken prisoner during the fighting felt a little more relaxed than they had at the time they passed into American hands. Their fears about their treatment by U.S. troops had pretty well evaporated after the first few weeks. Occasionally, new prisoners would be brought in, captured in the minor skirmishes which still occurred in the interior. And some Japanese soldiers actually gave themselves up voluntarily. How is the condition of surprise of the Japanese force at the present time? Oh. Very scared, sir. Uh, would that be one of the reasons why you decided to come over to our side? Give yourself up. With the battle for Bougainville won, U.S. troops could really relax and enjoy the programs from Radio Tokyo, broadcast for their benefit. And hello to all my little American blockheads on Bougainville. Do my records remind you of home, of your wives and sweethearts? Lay down your arms and go home to them. Why should you fight this stupid war for the four F who are taking your girls away from you? Right this moment, your sweetheart may be dancing with one of them, with the lights down low. Are you listening? The advance against the enemy below the equator was the left uppercut in the U.S. attack. In the Central Pacific, the Gilbert Islands marked the enemy's outer defense. 
In November 1943, the U.S. threw its right cross.